Welcome to the Proact Toolsets Lesson 5, Trade-Offs. Understanding how to manage conflicting objectives. This lesson covers the T, Trade-Off, in the Proact decision-making process. In the last lesson, Consequences, we identified a series of consequences based on the decision objectives and alternatives that we had defined in the previous steps of the Proact process. As part of the Consequences step, we eliminated those alternatives that were clearly inferior when compared to the others. For example, you may remember the Petersons eliminating their holiday to Paris and Disneyland because the overall cost of this holiday exceeded their budget. Being able to eliminate one alternative based on a single decision objective is unusual, because how often is it that we make a complex decision based on a single objective? Complex decisions are complex because we're having to decide between multiple decision objectives. This lesson describes the different ways to eliminate your alternatives until you are left with a final alternative on which to base your decision. This lesson consists of this presentation together with a lesson guide to help you manage any conflicting objectives you may encounter when making your decision. In this presentation, and using a case study, we will learn how to eliminate what are called dominated alternatives. Situations where it's clear that all of the decision objectives of one alternative are superior to those of another. We'll then learn how to make trade-offs using a technique called even swap, when not all the decisions of one alternative are superior to those of another. Meet Mizuki. Although she has a day job as a designer, Mizuki's real passion in life is painting. Her dream is to one day give up her job and become a professional painter. As a step toward making this dream a reality, Mizuki decides to approach the landlords of four vacant stores in her town to see if they would provide her with a lease for a week so that she could hold an exhibition of her work. To her surprise, all the landlords agree to her idea. So Mizuki needs to reach a decision about which store she will use. Mizuki's decision problem is to learn about whether people other than friends and family, like her paintings enough to want to buy them. With this in mind, she's identified five decision objectives to help answer this problem. Objective 1. In order to display as many of her paintings as possible, the store needs a minimum square footage of 600 feet. Objective 2. In order to expose her work to as many people as possible, the location of the store must be close to or on a street used by shoppers and office workers. Objective 3. The store must contain facilities such as a toilet and a means to make a hot drink so that Mizuki never has to leave the store. Objective 4. The vacant store's state of decoration must not put off potential customers from coming in to view the paintings. Objective 5. The overall budget, including the week's rent, must not exceed £300. Mizuki then considers the consequences for her alternatives. While she has the square footage, rent, and information about the facilities for each store, these are her objective consequences, she creates her own scales for the two subjective consequences, location and decoration. Having identified all of her consequences, and not finding any of the stores to be obviously inferior to the others, she draws her consequences table, which looks like this. Mizuki has used a scale of very high, high, medium, low and very low to describe the amount of exposure the store has to shoppers and office workers. She also uses a score out of 10, where 10 is excellent to rate the store's state of decoration. Practical Dominance Finding the best alternative for a decision occurs through a process of elimination. That is, you want to remove those alternatives whose consequences are inferior to the consequences of other alternatives. The first way to do this is to look for what is called practical dominance. Practical dominance is where the consequences of one alternative are superior or dominate the consequences of another. The way to do this is to compare alternatives in pairs. Reviewing her consequences table, Mizuki notices that the consequences of store 1 dominate those of store 3 because it has a larger square footage, 
it has greater exposure to people passing by, it has more facilities, and it is in a better state of decoration. Having eliminated Store 3, Mizuki repeats the process again, this time comparing Store 1 and Store 4. Because of Store 1's dominance, she can eliminate Store 4 from her decision. Pleased with the progress that she's made, Mizuki now compares Store 1 with Store 2. But there's a problem. While it's clear that 2 has more square footage and is in a better state of decoration, Store 1 has better exposure and is cheaper to rent than Store 2. It's often the case, as in Mizuki's situation, that important decisions involve pursuing multiple objectives simultaneously. And more often than not, we will find ourselves with conflicting objectives, such as one store having more space to hang pictures, but having comparatively poorer exposure to people passing by. When it's no longer possible to show practical dominance between alternatives, we have to take a different approach. If practical dominance involves eliminating the columns of a consequences table, the alternatives, what we have to do now is eliminate rows, the decision objectives, one at a time until we're left with a single row on which to base our decision. Reviewing a consequences table, Mizuki can eliminate the facilities objective because they are similar for store 1 and store 2. The reason for eliminating this row is because whatever decision she reaches, she will end up with a store with the same facilities. The same, unfortunately, can't be said for the other objectives. This is where the T and the PROACT process comes into play. What Mizuki needs to do now is to create similarities between objectives by making trade-offs so that she can then eliminate them. A trade-off involves giving away one kind of value in return for something that is of a different kind of value. Every day we make trade-offs. For instance, going to bed early one night because we have to be somewhere early the next morning. Driving the extra mile between petrol station A and petrol station B because the fuel at petrol station B is cheaper. Declining dessert because we're watching our weight. When we make a trade-off, we're converting the value of one thing into the value of another. Being able to stay up late versus getting up early. The time and cost of driving an extra mile versus the cost of cheaper fuel. And the pleasure of a dessert versus the displeasure of a thicker waistline. Mizuki needs to perform trade-offs between her objectives so that she can create equality between them in order to then eliminate them. To her, a good place to start is in the difference in the square footage between stores 1 and 2. She calculates how much a square foot of store 1 would cost to rent. She then multiplies it by 100 square feet, the difference between store 1 and store 2. Having calculated the cost of an extra 100 square feet, Mizuki changes the values in a consequences table so that both stores 1 and 2 have the same square footage, while the cost of the additional space, 32 pounds and 14 pence, is added to store 1's budget. Since both stores now share the same square footage, Mizuki is able to eliminate this objective. So what Mizuki did was to trade off more space in store 1 for additional rent in order to create equivalence for a square footage objective. Now while she can't actually rent additional space for store 1, Mizuki is using this paper exercise to swap one kind of value for another in order to even out the square footage problem. What she did is called an even swap. Performing an even swap helps to create theoretical similarities so that, just like both stores having the same facilities, an objective no longer needs consideration. Performing even swaps helps to reduce the complexity of your decision, and depending on the complexity of the decision you're making, you may find yourself performing a number of even swaps before you're able to show practical dominance. Now back to Mizuki's decision. Having removed square footage from a decision, Mizuki checks the columns of her consequences table to see if there's any practical dominance between store 1 and store 2. 
while Store 1 is still cheaper and has greater exposure to passers-by, Store 2 is in better decorative order. So for the moment, there is no practical dominance. Mizuki realises that she needs to conduct another even swap. Having visited Store 1, Mizuki is aware that one of the walls needs a coat of paint and the floors and windows are thorough clean. A coat of paint and clean floors and windows would certainly raise Store 1's decoration score from 7 to 8. In order to increase the score by 1, Mizuki estimates that she would need to spend around £35 on paint and cleaning products. Mizuki changes the decoration score for Store 1 from 7 to 8, and then adds £35 to the budget enabling her to eliminate her decoration objective. Having conducted her second even swap, Mizuki checks the columns of her consequences table again. This time, there is practical dominance, since Store 1's budget is cheaper, though only just, and its exposure is greater than Store 2. So after eliminating Stores 3 and 4 using practical dominance, and then conducting two even swaps, Mizuki can see that the best choice for solving her decision problem to learn about whether people, other than friends and family, like her paintings enough to want to buy them is to run her exhibition in Store 1. Remember the Petersons' holiday decision? Here's their consequences table to remind you. The first thing that the Petersons do is to look for practical dominance. Conducting a comparison of the holidays in pairs, it's clear that the cottage in the Cotswolds should be eliminated because it's dominated by both the holiday in Crete and the UK holiday village. Unfortunately, it's not possible to show practical dominance when comparing the remaining two holidays. So, the first thing that the Petersons do is to eliminate the rows that is the objectives, that share the same value. Being left with the overall holiday cost and the time adults relax together objectives, Mr and Mrs Peterson must do some research into the cost of childcare and supervised children's activities to be able to conduct an even swap. After reading some travel brochures and a quick call to a travel agent, they learn that the average hourly cost covering both of their children is £30. Using this hourly value, Mr and Mrs Peterson calculate that they would require £630 in order to be able to enjoy an additional three hours of adult relaxation time each day of their holiday. Performing the even swap, it's apparent that buying themselves an additional three hours of adult relaxation time per day will push the holiday to Crete over their £1,500 budget by £180. So due to the additional cost, the holiday that best meets their decision objectives and solves the decision problem is the UK Holiday Village. When you have a complex decision, one that involves multiple decision objectives, the chances are that eliminating alternatives based on practical dominance won't be enough. Use the even swap method to help you think through the value of every trade-off in a rational and measured way so that you're able to solve your decision problem.